Okay, go. Great. It's nice to be here again. I think this is about the, the 30th time I've spoken at iDate. That's better. Um, so I run a little site called Online Personals Watch. We summarize the news for you. Every day we spend three hours reading the news, so you don't have to. You can summarize, you can get, stay ahead of the news with about three minutes of, of reading on a daily basis. So I recommend uh, you can subscribe right here and get daily news and not miss a beat. I've been working in the internet dating business since 2004 and uh, actually going back even beyond that since about 1998 but we've been running online personals watch since 2004 and uh, I started Portland Brooks which is a consultancy for the internet dating business in 2005. We do PR, biz dev and strategy and we are myopic and totally focused on the internet dating business. Uh, so it's, uh, my, my wife works with me as well, we're a team of 12 people in all. We've got a few properties that I just wanted to highlight here beyond online personal watch. We have internet dating investments. If your thing is investing and you just want to stay ahead of the investment news and the M&A deals that are happening, uh, then go to this site. You can subscribe and just get that. If you're an affiliate or an affiliate manager or marketeer, you should be subscribed to internet dating affiliates. If you're looking for a job or if you have a job you want to offer, you can go to internet dating jobs. Just send me, uh, in fact, send tips at onlinepersonalswatch.com, your job listings, and we'll be happy to list those for free for you. Beyond that, we also think that it's very important that you stay ahead of the social media news. And so we created Social Networking Watch in 2006. These industries, of course, are very closely tied. You've got to keep heads, uh, heads up on what's going on in that industry, too. And I'm going to be talking more about wearable computing. In fact, I just came back from the Glaze Conference in San Francisco, and we spent a couple of days talking about wearable computing. There was about 1,200 people in, in, in attendance. Um, we, it's very important that we stay ahead of wearable computing because in three or four years' time, we're going to be very tightly tied to that industry. Full disclosure, I've only managed to talk about two companies that I've worked with in the past year. It's Amalife Media and Plenty of Fish. Uh, we're going to talk about market overview, public companies and numbers, what's hot, the innovation, and my favorite subject, innovation in the future. But let's just get our heads around mobile. What's happening with mobile uh, and the rise of mobile? It's, uh, mobile web traffic now stands at about 24% worldwide of all, all internet traffic. This is up very considerably over last year. It was around 14% last year. Now it's 24%. Why is that? Um, I actually interviewed Sam Yegan from uh, Match.com. Match Group. He's the CEO of Match Group. Um, and a couple of other people. So he's going to tell us why why he thinks mobile's up. Dating is a category that is inherently mobile. Um, unlike some products, which mobile is just another interface to, to reach the same content. Dating in, in a dating app, you ultimately um, want to meet someone that you date. That you date in person. You have to be in the same place at the same time with another human. That is inherently a mobile activity. Um, so I think I think dating um, is 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 more tuned uh, to, to mobile than almost any other category. The majority of our usage across our businesses uh, is mobile, uh, whether it's logins or messages or, or time spent, whatever, whatever, whatever we want to count, we're we're, we're primarily mobile. Um, and you will see more and more of our uh, focus, both in terms of engineering, but also in terms of product and innovation, go in that direction. So you pointed out that not all of our products um, have have apps that we're going to correct that. Specifically, People Media. I'm surprised People Media don't have mobile apps, and so they're going to correct that. People Media is Black Christian People Media, etc. So mobile is actually due to overtake desktop-based uh, access to the internet uh, in 2016-2017. So let me show you what we're looking at here. Uh, we've got worldwide. Desktop usage in decline and worldwide mobile usage increasing. And if we extrapolate forwards, about 2017, we're going to see more mobile usage worldwide than desktop. North America, that's uh, North America, and India is already there. India's already passed 67%, two years ago in fact, 67% uh, 67 mobile usage in India. But mobile is highly addictive. One thing we really need to consider is that the growth of Addicts is really uh, growing, and I think that's really indicative of the medium. This medium is very immediate; it's very intimate. 
and some people get really addicted to that. And here's the numbers on that, in fact, courtesy of Flurry from March 2014. Um, what we see here is that the average users launch apps around 10 times a day. Addicts, we categorize it about six times that. So looking at the people who launch apps over 60 times a day, um, that's 176 million people worldwide, up from 79 per people a day. That's 79 million people a day last year. 52% of those are female, so it's a slight preponderance female. Um, so this is the power user set here. And this growth, this is the fastest growth. So people are really getting hooked on, on mobile apps. Now here's Marcus Friend. Uh, he's the CEO of Plenty of Fish. I asked him about mobile, and here's what he had to say. Everything is just moving mobile. Everything's getting more casual, not more serious. Well, mobile is mostly about impulsiveness, not about you know thinking and, and, and sitting down and planning out exactly what you want or looking for exactly the right person. So it's it's a it's a function of the technology, not of the times. Mobile is more casual, and that's not because people want to be casual on dating. It's a function of the media. Well, let's, let's consider iOS versus Android. I asked Marcus about this too. iOS is far more challenging for us. There's just more things that can go wrong. I, I don't know, we just really have very few problems with our Android app. And it's always the iPhone that we have all these issues with. And the fact that iPhone is not growing as fast as Android. But who's using what? Do you think Android's beating iOS at this stage in terms of users? Yes, it is. According to Comscore Mobile Ends, 52% of users are on Android. In fact, let me give you some analysis here. Uh, there are 166 million people that own smartphones in the USA now. And Apple is the top manufacturer, single manufacturer, with 41%. Android, there's no change year over year, surprisingly enough. Um, you know, a couple of years ago, I would have predicted that Android would have continued to steal market share from iOS. It's not the case. Uh, Apple is up from about 39% one year ago. Blackberry is down from 5%. Microsoft, no change. And Symbian is down from 1%. So uh, really, Android and iOS are the, are the games in town. So I asked uh, Sam, which made more money for Match? Here's what he had to say. Uh, Sam, by the way, here's his bio. Went to Harvard, Stanford, uh, and he started OkCupid okay and has been involved with a number of uh, incubators as well. I think the data probably still show that iOS generates more revenue and more conversion. Okay. iOS makes more. How about plenty of fish? We make about equivalent amounts of money from users. It doesn't matter if they're on Android or iPhone. And as far as I know, that, that applies to all the major players. I, I, I'd say probably Android makes a little more money because you don't have to pay Google 30%, but you have to pay uh, uh, Apple. So um, who are the operators in the room? Can we do a quick survey, perhaps? Who's making more money from Android? Yeah, two, two votes. Three? Okay, three more. Three from making more from Android. How about from uh, iOS? Who's making more on iOS? One, two, three. All right. So, Marcus and Sam are uh, middle of the road as well. So. All right. So, iPads and iPhone owners do <coughs> more for apps. This is actually a survey from Flurry, and uh, iPhone users spend on average 19 cents per app download. <coughs> Uh, on iPad, it's 50 cents, but on Android, it's a lot more free apps, basically. So a typical user pays 6 cents per app on average. But how is users are indulgent? Let's look at the classification, how these different sets are classified. iOS users tend to be more indulgent. They are twice as likely to make a six-figure salary. They are 18% more likely to work out every day. And iOS users drink 50% more often and use drugs twice as often. <laughs> Meanwhile, Android users are uh, uh, most often working. Uh, they're, they're more labor and construction type people. Uh, they, Android users are 30% more likely to make under $60,000 and they're 20% more likely than iOS users to be divorced. Take that as you want. So I asked Aaron Schildkraut, 
who is the CEO of How About We, about his mobile revenues, how they compare to online. Here's Aaron, also a Harvard boy, an educator. Uh, he actually was just a school teacher before he started How About We. This is a nascent space. It's a huge space. Couples spend hundreds of billions of dollars every year on out-of-home experiences. Um, they make a very large percentage of household spending choices together. Uh, and nothing on the internet has really yet met their needs. So I, I think it's a huge opportunity, but I don't think it's easy. And I think there will be, um, there, there are a bunch of companies that have started that have sort of gotten it right in terms of direction, but not necessarily in terms of execution. And, um, and the big winners are yet to be determined. So uh, it's not surprising to me that there's some paltering kind of early step. I think the couple space is going to be 20x bigger than the dating space ever will be. Uh, couples are just a, a, a massive untapped, untapped market. And we'll talk a more about that later on. But he's saying views are higher on mobile, far more engaging. Uh, the revenues right now for how about we at least are slightly less, and we're seeing that you know, Zeus numbers, we'll cover that in a second. But let's talk about the rankings really quickly. For the first time, we were able to get numbers from Comscore Mobile Lens um, as of April. Who would you say would be the top mobile dating service? Want to have a stab? Who's the top one? <coughs> Tinder? No. Number four. Who's number one? Sorry? Zeus is number three. Here we go. So Match is number one, not the group, I should say, the whole lot. Now, Plenty of Fish comes in at number two, Zeus is number three. And this is browser and app combined, it's not just apps, by the way. So these people are accessing the websites HTML, on HTML5 as well, and the whole lot combined. Courtesy of Comfortable Mobile Apps, thank you very much. They've not shared these numbers with me before, but we finally got hold of these things. Um, and Spark Network's coming in at Four, five, six for Spark, seven for Scout, eight for, num um, for eHarmony. Let's look at the year over year growth. And let me just trace this out for you so you can see what's going on. We've got match.com up here in blue. Uh, we have Zeus here in red. We have plenty of fish here in green. Spark networks in brown. And then Ashley Madison coming through here. Yeah. Quite a bit of advertising around Valentine's, right? And in purple we have Tinder, also growing quite rapidly. And let me give you the analysis on that. Match.com, that match mobile traffic grew 32% year over year. And traffic grew took off over Valentine's Day. Plenty of fish mobile traffic grew 48% year over year. Zeus mobile traffic grew, meanwhile, just 6%. Ashley Madison traffic grew 136%. And Spark Networks is up 106%. But here's some top level takeaway numbers for you. Over 50% we've been tracking this year over year. It's going up every year. But now, uh, over 50% of Match.com signups are from mobile. Those are signups, not just accessing the website, but people signing up. 85% of Plenty of Fish user overall is via mobile phone. So very much focused on, on mobile. Uh, but how about the money? Zeus gave us this number in the rest one. 41% of Zeus revenue comes from mobile. Let's talk more about the money. Here's the split. Numbers courtesy of Ida's World. 49% of mobile dating revenue is coming from online dating. 26% from mobile. Matchmakers are 14%. This is a very tough number for them to assess, by the way, because it's a very fragmented industry. So take this with a huge grain of salt, but sounds like the right ballpark to me. Uh, singles event, 7%. I don't know about that. I, I think that's really high. Uh, and other 4%. And here's how they're saying the numbers have grown from mobile dating from year to year. They've said in this, in this time period that it was growing 70% a year, moving forward by 27, uh, 2017, uh, they think it's going to be four or five hundred million dollars a year, just in mobile dating. Huge pinch of salt. But. So let's have a look at uh, downloads. And this is worldwide, 
These are the worldwide download numbers, courtesy of App Annie, in 2014 so far. We've got uh, Google Play downloads are higher than iOS worldwide by 45%. So the downloads are a lot higher for iOS <coughs> worldwide. The reason for that is because of Russia, Brazil, and Mexico, and Turkey. They, they've all grown very significantly with Google Play. Meanwhile, though, iOS makes 8% more money. So the money's on iOS, the downloads, a lot of activity on Google Play. That gap is narrowing. And it's, it's, it's narrowing largely because of the US and UK, not because of uh, BRIC and you know, Russia, Brazil, Mexico, Turkey. Yeah, a lot of activity there, but it's not monetizing as much. The gap is actually narrowing in the US and UK. Uh, so let's look at the top countries by download. There's a substantial lead for downloads in the US, but there are strong gains in China, very strong growth in China. And for Google Play, there's very strong growth across BRIC. Let's look at revenue. Courtesy of uh, Revenue growth is happening in USA and China, also Vietnam and South Africa. That's where the money is coming in. USA and China mainly now. That's where the growth is happening. And by the way, just email me if you want a copy of this. There's a lot of, this is a little small to see. If you'd like a copy of this, just send me an email. I'm easy to find. Just go to online personal watch. Market, market, online personal watch. I'll send you copies. PDF. Uh, Oh, so the top categories by revenue social networking comes in at number two uh, for iOS and number three for Google Play, games being the number one earner. Let's look at music revenue. Now, music actually has been breaking out their mobile numbers for some years now. So you can see the growth. Uh, back in 2009, they were making 3.6 million euros a year. Now that's doubled to, uh, in 2013. They said they earned 7 million euros from mobile, which is actually really small. That's a very small amount of, of their total business. Actually, it's 4% of their total revenues. In 2013, they made 165 million euros. So surprisingly small. So work to do there. Um, so what companies, back to Match, what companies are Match Group thinking about buying? I asked Sam this question. Globally, um, we tend to look more at geographic gaps. Um, so uh, there are certain countries where we don't have uh, a, a great presence, but we're not a market leader. So we'll always be looking there. Um, but we're also looking at people who have uh, found interesting ways to get scale. So he's looking for geographic gaps. He's looking for companies that are growing quickly. And they're really looking for strategic acquisitions at this stage. And the other thing I can tell you is they're not really uh, valuing based on forward valuations. So if your company, they say that, <laughs> they say that. So if, if your company is growing very quickly and you say, well, in three years' time, I'm going to be this big, if you value based on that, they're not so keen on valuing on that. Well, of course, they would say that, but the reality show is different. Um, okay, Cupid, of course, was bought for 50 million with earn out to come to about $90 million. Uh, uh, when in actual fact, our revenues are on the order of four and a half million dollars a year. So they will pay significant multiples when it's a strategic acquisition, when it's growing fast, also when it's a geographic strategic acquisition. Let's look at Snap Interactive. They've got numbers as well. Thank you very much. Um, what we're looking at here is the uh, net revenue versus the net profit. And of course, they're very much in growth mode and spending money to grow, uh, but they've ratcheted things back. And they've also done a deal with Match. They're doing a, a, an app deal with Match, which I think is a precursor towards something a lot more meaningful. Smile, feedback, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so um, Q1, they made revenue of 3.2 million. They lost 933,000. Uh, revenue drop uh, that you see here is because of less advertising. And they're focusing on developing their site. And Snap said in their annual report for stockholders that they expect to be cash flow positive in Q3 2014. Um, just watch it. I think Match is going to buy. I've got no feedback on that except the odd smile. Um, <laughs> so uh, we'll see. Zeus is losing money, but they, they're looking at, they're making $200 million a year at the stage. These are Zeus public numbers. Uh, they put a lot of numbers in their S1. They're going to go public very soon. Uh, they listed for $100 million recently. 
Here are the top hat. Overall, and Zeus comes in at number three. This is a listing from App Annie, very bang up today, May 2014. The top hats by monthly revenue, excluding games. And Zeus comes in at number three, we take out the games. Overall, Zeus is number one now for, in the, in the internet, in the mobile dating space, Zeus ranks number one on iTunes. Matches number two, okay, keep it coming in at number three. Grinder, by the way, um, Zeus over to Grinder. Grinder was, uh, was top of the charts last year. Grinder was top grossing app one year ago, okay? Yeah? And in terms of free iPhone apps, uh, the Tinder is getting the most activity followed by plenty of fish and match. So what's hot? Obviously Tinder's very hot. We've seen it in the news a lot. They're growing very considerably internationally as well. Uh, they launched September 2012 and they took off at college campuses first. They seeded and grew very successfully on college campus, campuses. They're to the top free dating app in iOS now. So I asked Marcus, what do you think of this? What do you think of Tinder? Interesting response. The vast majority of what's happening now is mobile. The web is kind of going away with the dinosaur. So, so how much of a threat is Tinder? Uh, and what do you think their next move will be? Yeah, I, I, I don't think they have that much foresight. There, there, there's millions of, of companies or thousands of companies that start and go nowhere. This one just happened to go somewhere. It's essentially a modern version of Hot or Not. Yeah. Um, but the intention to date, the intention to meet up, you know, the, the amount of details in the profiles just aren't there. So it's not like, you know, although Tinder is growing in leaps and bounds, it's not like it's affecting traffic of existing dating sites. So if there was an impact, we would have already seen it. And we're certainly not seeing it. I, I think it's just bringing more people to the category. Are you feeling some impact from Tinder? Do you agree with that statement? This is a survey. Yeah? Alex, you, you are seeing some impact. Okay, anyone else seeing impact? I agree with the statement. Yeah? No Fantastic, wow, okay. Yeah, it's good for the category. A lot of press, a lot of user awareness. Does it make internet dating, mobile dating cool? This is very old functionality though. I mean, this is from Hot or Not was a hallmark uh, dating app. Very simple, um, a, a, a very high utility app. Anyway, Match, uh, OKQ, why is Tinder so popular? It's redesigned for smartphones and for men millennials. I think that's their secret. They, they've hit the right demographic um, and it's really beautifully tuned for smartphones. Um, and sites like eHarmony, Match, and OKCupid remain sites that users browse browse alone at home, whereas Tinder is a more social experience. If you, if you look at user behavior, people are typically passing the phone around, having a laugh, like, wow, well, you know, it's a very, it's a social experience. And engagement is really key for Tinder. They've got one billion daily profile views at this stage. Now, there's an interesting piece of news uh, a few weeks back, back in uh, April 11th, there was some news that IAC, uh, Bloomberg reported that IAC bought 10% of Tinder shares for $500 million. If you do the math on that, that means that Tinder's worth $5 billion. And in comparison, IAC as a whole is worth $6 billion. So they're saying that, they were saying that Tinder uh, was worth not far short of what the whole IAC group was, was worth. And that, of course, was utter, utter total BS. It's not true. They, they got the numbers wrong. So they, they saw a short-term tick up and then a very quick tick down when people realized that that's actually completely not true. And so I didn't give that number out, I don't know who did, but Sam corrected them. So Match.com's really done their app and they've been inspired by Tinder. They have Mixer and they have Stream. These are two elements of their new app which are entirely uh, inspired. Uh, Mixer, you actually swipe left and right just like Tinder, and stream shows you an endless stream of, of matches. And uh, there is news that Tinder's gonna start monetizing very soon, from advertising and freemium. They're playing around with it now. So let's look on the, uh, look to, uh, the Google searches, Google Trends, to see the top brands, <coughs> and see how they're trending over time. In red you can see match. This is from 2005, so we're going back quite a way in time. 2005 through 2013. This is the occurrences from the trending 
of people typing in match. And of course, the funny thing is when people are searching for match.com, they'll type match into Google. For some strange reason, so many people, if you look at your search terms, what's bringing traffic, people type in match, they type match.com, whatever your brand name is, they're typing that in, that's going to be top of the charts for your, uh, your type, what people are looking for before they come to your site. So match, trending down, we've got purple here is internet dating overall. Yeah. So we had a peak in 2006 through 2009, now it's gone quiet, as Facebook basically and social networking grew. Plenty of fish on the up and then on the down. I think it's partly because people are typing in POS these days. That brand's been, re been established. In green we have Zeus picking up and Tinder through the roof. Through the roof. So Tinder and Zeus are, are getting the, the attention essentially at the stage. Uh, Zeus, of course, has filed for an IPO, $100 million, that's really good for the industry. Match Group uh, may well be next if they break away from IAC. These are good things overall for the industry. They'll drive awareness and attention, and uh, it's up to us to make use of that, really. I mean, you, you want to be ready for that. The press are going to come calling, and, and you want to be ready to tell your story. So Tinder made $178 million last year and had a $2.6 million loss. They have now 26 million members. That's up from 18 million last year. 650,000 of those are paying now. That's up from 483,000 last year. And they're in 80 countries. And they've raised $60 million in VC funding since 2007. Let's talk about innovation. Match.com is getting into high dollar matchmaking. I find it very intriguing because, oh boy, I mean, this is a very different business. Um, I've been to the match matchmaking conference a couple of times and it's a very different room. It's a very different group. It's a very different discipline. Um, I mean, matchmakers are really in front of our users. And what I experienced when I went to the matchmaking conference is it's 80% female, 70, 80% female. Very, very loud. I mean, it's just everybody's high charisma, everybody's talking, and it's just crazy levels of energy. And we are more techie, we're more marketing oriented, we're male dominated, 70%, which is a bit strange, you know, given the nature of the business, but it, we were talking about tech and marketing. Um, eHarmony, by the way, they also launched a matchmaking service charging about $5,000. Now, this is really dangerous territory. It's dangerous territory. Actually, Match.com tried this some years ago. Um, actually, uh, I think it was about 2008, Jim Safka was the head of Match. And I went to a little meeting in New York. He pulled in some press and some of the few analysts that exist in this space. And they had a meeting. And, and he said, I'm going to bill Match to a $1 billion a year company. And matchmaking is going to be a huge part of that. He, they hired four matchmakers. They got rid of them very shortly afterwards. And I think what they realized is that people won't forgive $5,000. If you extract $5,000 from someone, they are not going to be happy if you don't give them the love of their life. So you can't oversell in this space. And three-day rule does a nice job. They don't oversell. They're, they're, uh, they're not hard sell. Three-day rule uh, has partnered with Match, of course. They're in New York, Los Angeles, San Francisco, Chicago right now. And they're going to be expanding to Dallas, Boston, and Washington. That's not a huge footprint. But there aren't very many national footprint matchmakers left. Um, there's a couple left. So they charge six months. Uh, they charge five grand for every six months, by the way. Let's talk about, to Sam about this some more. Some of the matchmakers out there use negativity and scare tactics in recruiting uh, uh, their clients. Um, they, they bring people into their office, and it's a really hard sell um, uh, you know, you're going to be hopeless without us. Your eggs are drying up, um, and and we want we want our matchmaking service to be positive and empowering um, and aspirational. Let's see what Aaron has to say about this. I think that there is a large market opportunity around a matchmaking service that is facilitated by the internet. People want particularly people who are the buyers of luxury goods, want a carefully crafted, curated, personalized concierge service level 
experience for finding love. Um, and I think there's an opportunity there. I don't think there are that many humans that are in that class, but I think that they are willing to spend a lot of money on it and that a great experience could be provided much better than the current matchmaking experiences that are out there. So I think, I think without a doubt that you know, somebody will make that business in the next you know, three years. And I really think there's an opportunity for mobile as well. This is, uh, we all know now that mobile is a superior platform. It, it mates beautifully with internet dating. But matchmaking needs to be part of this mix as well. Because if you have the immediacy of coaching and feedback on the mobile phone, if you can actually really monitor people and get data from maybe wearable computing apps, then, then this, this, I see our world really flourishing as we consolidate these multiple mediums and modes of matching. There's a lot more money to be made if we can do a better job. And doing a better job means harnessing all of the media and making use of the different modes and, for God's sake, making more money by using matchmaking or a version of. So, uh, one of the things that we're really, we really suck at is, is getting post-date feedback. So when our people go out, when our users go out on date, how do we know if it went well? It's really important for us to know so that we can tweak our algorithm, so we can do a better job next time around. eHarm is experimenting with this. Um, there's a, a, an app you should have a look at. I don't know how on earth they're going to do this, because this is really dangerous territory as well. Google Glass say they're not going to enable facial recognition, but I don't know. I think they're going to have to at some stage. Um, so Name Tag is the first dating app developed for Google Glass. And they're a facial recognition app that uses Google Glass Camera to identify passers by, uh, matching it with their online profiles, apparently. I don't know how they're going to do this, because I don't think that Google's going to be too pleased with it. But um, let's see. So let's talk momentarily about offline. Uh, how about we, I asked Aaron about this. We started off as an innovative dating company that we dubbed the offline dating site. Um, the whole idea was to uh, change the pattern of online dating so that rather than it being about endless profile browsing, winking, poking, uh, and just messaging online without any actual offline experience, uh, we wanted to flip that script and make online dating all about meeting up in the real world, having real experiences, discovering your city, encountering new people, feeling chemistry in the real world. Um, even when we created How About We For Couples, the core idea was make date night happen. Um, you know, eliminate kind of the endless pattern of going to the same places or staying in and try to help couples um, find amazing new experiences in their city. Um, you know, the studies show that if you repeatedly surprise each other and have new experiences together as a couple, you're something like 300% more likely to report yourselves as um, genuinely happy in your relationship. And I think that for singles, going on dates, doing fun things on first dates makes first dates much more uh, exciting and successful. So does anybody remember the program? Anybody, any Brits in the room that remember a program called How About, uh, How About We? <laughs> Why Don't You? It was a program in England, and it was a ditty. Why don't you just get up and go do something more interesting instead? Our whole basis of the program was getting the hell away from the TV and go do something other than sitting in front of the TV. And uh, it kind of reminds me of how about we's about. It's really contradiction in terms. We're focused on retention, keeping people communicating in front of the computer, keep hitting off those $30 a month. Whereas how about we is taking this approach that they want to get people out, away from the computer, which is not really what they want anyway. So uh, I like the integrity of the service. The lesson that we can learn is there's, I think there's opportunities for us to monetize as people say they want to go to a restaurant, that they need help. Finding out a restaurant works for the person they're interested in taking on a date, or a coffee shop even. And we need to be part of that pie. There's also about couples. Our business is hugely flawed because we wave goodbye to our users. When they find someone they like, they're gone for six, nine months, maybe forever. That's a problem. This is a nascent space. It's a huge space. Couples spend hundreds of billions of dollars every year on out-of-home experiences. Um, they make a very large percentage of household spending choices together, uh, and nothing on the internet has really yet met their needs. So I, I think it's a huge opportunity, but I don't think it's easy. 
and I think there will be um, there there are a bunch of companies that have started that have sort of gotten it right in terms of direction, but not necessarily in terms of execution. And um, and the big winners are yet to be determined. So uh, it's not surprising to me that there's some haltering kind of early step. I think the couple space is going to be 20x bigger than the dating space ever will be. Uh, couples are just a, a, a massive untapped untapped market. I like how about we? Because they're thinking differently. They are they are hitting some high notes here. These are hugely prospective areas, but just think about it logically. I mean, we're just tapping, we're just taking a small portion of, of the value that we could be offering our members. Um, our big problem is a waving goodbye. I think ultimately we need to have some continuity. If you've really got to know a single and you've done some kind of psychological assessment, you know, thinking forward, if you've monitored some of their behaviors, and this is where we have to go, if you've monitored and picked up some of the data from mobile, from wearable computing apps, if you've really got to know your user, you should know the failure modes of that relationship. And you should be able to provide some guidance based on those failure modes. If you know that a particular couple is likely to split up because of a particular character trait that's in conflict, you should be able to provide coaching against that. And that's something that's a very high value. Um, I, I like to kid that, you know, getting the girl and uh, keeping the girl is two different things. Um, we need to help them. And we need to stay in contact with our users based on that. Let's talk about the future. I've shown this a couple of years. That's right, bro. Our ancestors had buttons. That's right here. Our ancestors had tails. My wife did this one, okay. But the next step is flexible phones. That's right, dear. Our ancestors couldn't do this. Oh, oh dear, okay. <laughs> what can we expect from smartphones? Well, they're gonna go flexible. And we're gonna see flexible displays. We're gonna see augmented reality. Yeah, this is the next thing. This is very closely tied to wearable computing. Um, here's a great app. You know what I like for a great app for augmented reality? It's not internet dating oriented, but um, I like using RunKeeper. And I could imagine, in fact, this is in development. Uh, there's an app on Google Glass. You can run down the road. You can set pace and say, I want to run at this particular pace. And then there's a guy that runs in front of you. And you have to kind of keep up with him. Otherwise, you know, it's great psychology. If you've not seen this video, you, have you seen this video? Oh my god, it's an incredible video. Oh, okay, well keep your eye on OPW. I'll run it again. But this is a, a fantastic mind-blowing video that shows you what could happen with Google Glass and the integration of data coming in from other wearable computing apps and, uh, and essentially coaching singles through a date. And uh, it's very amusing. I, I, I've got to remember to run that again for you. Um, 3D screens and holograms if we think even further out into the future, that's also going to have an impact on us. But I asked Marcus about wearables. Is he thinking about wearables at this stage? We have a Google Glass uh, uh, that we have around the office here, but no plans for an app yet. It's, it's actually very small, very limiting. So I think, you know, maybe in a year or two when better versions come along or more interesting, uh, uh, you know, facial recognition is banned, a lot of, a lot of stuff is just banned. So and, and, until there's a wide install base until people are using it. We're not, we're not going to play with it. This is a nascent space. The numbers are iffy, but I do have numbers for you. The numbers show that by 2018, according to BCC research, they think the wearable computing space will be $30 billion a year. Um, in fact, there was a conference I just came from, a glazed conference in San Francisco. And we had about 1,200 people there, and it's... Really, the fellow that's running that conference is doing a good job of, he's um, very casual. He used to work for Scout, interestingly enough. And um, he's really getting people to collaborate. And that's so important for us, because what we need from the wearables industry is data. You know, we, we had some discussion at the, the first talk today. It was like, how do we work with them? Do we create an app? Do we create clothing? No, of course we don't. We want data, that's it. We've got to make sure that we're on the maps of wearable computing companies so that they are willing to play with us. That's it. So is Matt thinking about wearables? I don't think we figured that out yet, um, but absolutely we're thinking about it. To me what's exciting about, about wearables is, uh, you, you used the word intimacy, which I think is, is great, but to me more than that, it's about, um, it's about the, the data collection that, that we're going to have. Uh, I think the future of our category is better and better algorithms. 
we started to give people because we believe the dating was a data game, dating was about the numbers. And you know, if you can imagine down the road, you have a Google Glass that knows, okay, there are 10 people in the room, you've looked at each one of them, and you've had a chemical hormonal response based on your attractiveness to each one of them. You don't have to tell me, you don't have to swipe right or swipe left anymore. I'll just know based on your emotional chemical response to a woman that you interact with, whether you like her or not, whether you're attracted to her or not. Um, and so that, is, that gets me more excited. That gets me more excited than saying, okay, well, yes, now I have an eye watch, I'm going to be able to swipe differently or, or not. If we can get access to a whole new type of data, that is going to make the algorithm that much better. You know, I, I was paired up to speak on stage with a fellow from Frog Design, who is a global VP of innovation for a, for a legendary design firm for called uh, Frog Design. And, and really the conclusion from that conversation was, it's so very difficult to do a good job of, good design isn't going to cut it in the world of computing space. It's got to be fantastic design because of the sheer intimacy and the sheer levels of trust that need to be built to share all this data. So fantastic design is the only option in the wearable computing space. And that is compounded because you've got hardware, you've got software, you've got UX considerations. Uh, it's just, we think we've got a tough job. They've got a very tough job. And they need money flow, and we've got the ability to give them some money and mon help them monetize. So that's really the pivot point for working with the wearable computing industry. Intimacy, better algorithms is our upside better monetization. So I'm so committed to this space that we have started wearable.ai, and this is the OPW of the wearable computing space. So if you go to wearable.ai, you can stay up on the news in exactly the same way you do with OPW. And I'm going to be developing that over the years, getting more hopefully of following, and helping to make sure that we don't miss this boat. Don't get left behind. It's Google Play, there's App Store, and eventually it'll be Glass, but that's just scratching the surface. Thank you very much. I run Holden Brooks. We help my dating businesses grow. Uh, essentially, we've got a team of 12 seasoned professionals. For $2,500 every two weeks, you get access to a team of professionals. And uh, we've been doing this since 2005, so we know all the staff. Thank you very much.